Good morning, everyone. So it's my great pleasure to uh, introduce <coughs> Professor Gu from Stony Brook University and Howard University. Uh, Professor, uh, Professor Gu uh, got his uh, PhD from Howard University in Computer Science Department, but is super, uh, supervised by a very famous mathematician, the field of modernist, uh, Professor how to pronounce yeah. Xin Tun Yao. Xin Tun Yao, yeah, very famous mathematician. So Professor Gu is one of the main founder for uh, one very uh, uh, found, uh, foundational uh, field, uh, which is a computational conformal uh, geometry. Uh, some, of, some of us maybe not uh, very familiar with it, uh, but uh, you, you will see, based on today's talk, is kind of the foundation for many, many things, including state of art, artificial intelligence, and deep neural network. Okay, without uh, further introducing, uh, let's uh, welcome our speaker. Oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you, Tianfu. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you for the invitation. So today I'm going to uh, uh, introduce some of our recent research, basically uh, from geometry to understanding uh, optimal transport. Okay, then uh, from optimal transport to understand uh, GAN model, generative adversarial uh, networks. <clears throat> so this is a joint work with a lot of mathematicians, computer scientists, uh, like Professor Xing Tung Yao uh, from Howard, and Professor Dimitri Samaras from Stony Brook. Okay, <clears throat> so this is the outline for today's talk. So first we try to understand um, the success for machine learning and uh, introduce a well-known concept for manifold distribution assumption. Then we introduce how, how deep learning really learn a manifold structure. Okay. Then we give a give an overview for optimal transportation theory. Okay, then we, we analyze the relation between generator and the discriminator, whether they really compete or should they collaborate. Then we explain mode collapse using a regularity theory from a partial different equation. And finally we, we propose a new model, okay, using an autoencoder and an optimal transportation map. Okay, to make the black box to be partially transparent. Okay, <clears throat> so the first part, manifold distribution. So we know that uh, deep learning is really successful, but uh, understanding for deep learning uh, remains really uh, primitive. We believe that um, the success of deep learning can be partially explained by the well-known uh, two hypotheses. One is called manifold uh, distribution. So basically, we believe that uh, the natural data Actually, they are disputed, okay, very close to a nonlinear low dimensional manifold in a very high data space, okay? So basically, we treat each data sample as one point, given a natural class for data in a, in a very high dimensional um, background space. But then the, 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 the point cloud actually are very close to a nonlinear low dimensional manifold. And the distribution of this point cloud is non uniform uh, either. So finding this manifold structure and then finding the distribution on this manifold is the major task for deep learning. So that's the first assumption. The second one is a cluster distribution. So within each big, big class, there are several subclasses. Then each subclass corresponding to a uh, different distribution. Then the distributions are far enough among those subclasses such that we can uh, differentiate them okay, using a machine learning method. And based on this, this uh, physical assumption, we deduce our theoretical framework for uh, understanding deep learning. Okay, so here we show some well-known example. So this is an uh, MNIST data set. So each image is a turn 8 by turn 8. So therefore, if we treat each image as one point, the dimension for image space is a, okay, a 784, okay, really high dimension. But then uh, we treat the handwritten digits as a point cloud, okay, in this really high image space. Then uh, those point cloud actually are very close to a two-dimensional manifold, okay, to a very, uh, very uh, specified surface. Then uh, using uh, <coughs> manifold embedding method, TSNE invented by Hinton, we can we can mapping okay the point cloud to to the plane. So each point here representing one image here. Here we have uh, 10 clusters, so each cluster uh, corresponding to one digit. From 0 to 9, there are 10 clusters. So this picture shows that okay, we have a surface in the uh, um, 784 dimensional space. But then we can flatten this surface okay, to the 2D parameter domain. So this is called a feature space or latent space. 
So this is called a data manifold in the image space. Okay? So here we can easily see the manifold structure. So if we use other deep learning method, like SAMIS, okay, network, then, then we can embed the handwritten data image okay, uh, to the 2D plane. Then we see the distribution, okay, different clusters for 10 digits. Okay? Okay, so therefore, we believe that uh, one of the major tasks for deep learning is try to find this mapping from data manifold okay, to, the, to the latent space. Okay, so if we go to mathematics, so basically uh, we model the ambient space, okay, uh, data space as Rn. Then uh, the interested class of data, okay, are distributed close to manifold sigma. Okay, then uh, the machine learning can map this data, okay, to the latent space or feature space. So this mapping is called encoding mapping. Okay, the inverse is called decoding. Okay. But uh, encoding mapping is not unique. <clears throat> there are many, many different ways to do encoding mapping. So therefore, we have a transformation from one encoding map to another one in the latent space. Okay? So therefore, uh, we can use a topological manifold structure to represent. Okay, so that's a classical mathematical definition for manifold. Uh, here we can, uh, we can visualize this concept using a low dimensional case. Okay, suppose, <clears throat> The image space or the ambient space is R3. Okay, the data manifold sigma is a happy Buddha surface. Okay, and then suppose we, we, we put a lot of samples on this surface. Okay, million samples. Okay, then we map the manifold. Okay, to the latent space. The latent space is a two-dimensional, so this mapping is called encoding. Okay, the inverse from this one to this one is a decoding. Okay. Um, <clears throat> So therefore, we require the encoding map to be a homomorphism or diffeomorphism. Basically, we require the mapping to be one-to-one, -one, okay, on two, okay, and also continuous, okay. So therefore, each point in the latent space is called a feature vector, okay. Then each point on the surface, okay, is called a data sample. So basically, we can freely translate from geometry language uh, to deep learning language, okay. So here we see different encoding map. So we map the curved manifold from ambient space to the to the latent space, but the mapping is not unique. It's not unique. Actually, there's an infinite such kind of mappings. So we can compare those two mapping. Then the, um, the significance for different mapping is that they will change probability distribution. Okay. So suppose we put uniform distribution, okay, uh, on the latent space. So when we pull back this di uniform distribution to the original data manifold, we see that this distribution is non-uniform, okay? We see some part is denser, okay, some part is sparser. So if we assume the data distribution on the data manifold is uniform, then this mapping doesn't preserve the measure, okay? Change the measure. But if we change to this coding, <laughs> then we see that if we put a uniform distribution here, when we pull back, we get a uniform distribution here. So then this means that this encoding map preserve the data distribution, from data manifold, okay, to the latent manifold. So therefore, there are two major tasks for deep learning. One is for manifold learning, finding the encoding decoding map. One is manipulating the distribution, okay, either in the image space or in the latent space, okay, from this feature. Okay. <clears throat> then uh, if we generalize to higher dimensional case, suppose we do a human facial image, then uh, we treat each human facial image as one point, so they form a manifold. So we know that um, in order to determine one image, basically we, we, we need a, a lot of parameters like human gene okay, to determine the shape, okay, then the view angle, the lighting condition, okay, cosmetic. So therefore, the dimension for this manifold is still very, very limited. Okay? Uh, according to uh, our experiment, we see that 100 dimension is good enough to describe uh, the human facial image manifold. Okay. Okay. Then for genetic model, basically you generate a white noise. Okay, in the latent space, then you map this point. Okay, back to the to the human facial manifold. Then each point on the human facial manifold give you one image. Okay. So that's the geometric view for this genetic model. Okay. So using this view, we can explain uh, a common task for image processing, image denoising. Okay. So image denoising is a common a uh, common task, okay? Then uh, conventionally, mm. we do a Fourier transform. Then uh, we do low-pass filter. Then uh, 
then we remove high-frequency high, uh, high component, then we do inverse Fourier transform. We get a denoise de image. So that's a conventional way to do image denoising. But using our manifold view, it's as follows. OK, so we use a clean facial images to train a manifold. OK? Then we represent this manifold using a deep neural network. Suppose we have a noisy image, P tilde here. We project this P tilde to the manifold. We find the closest point on the, on the clean manifold. So, so this point actually is the clean image, the noise image. OK? So basically, uh, we, we, we interpret um, image denoising using geometric projection. Okay? So then uh, this method is much better. Why? Because we have a very strong prior knowledge and encoded by the deep neural network. Okay? So here we show some example. We use a clean human facial photos to train manifold. Okay, and then uh, we have some noisy human face image. After projection, we get a clean image. Okay? We get a clean image. But then uh, uh, this method heavily depends on the content of the image. Suppose we have a, a noisy human face image, but we have a cat face manifold. When you project okay, from human face to the cat face, so the result doesn't make sense. Okay? So here we see when we, when we project okay, human face to the cat face, okay, the result does, doesn't make sense. So from one, one point of view, because we know the prior knowledge, okay, so therefore okay, the performance is much better. But the method is not, a, uh, it's not a general, very specific to the content. Okay? And you, you need to have this manifold at hand. Okay? So therefore, we can use this view to, to uh, explain uh, the major, major applications for deep learning, I think. OK, <clears throat> Okay. then the first task, how does a deep learning to learn a manifold? There are many ways, right? The most common way is using an uh, using a autoencoder. So basically, we treat each image uh, as a training data. We have a symmetric uh, network structure. Okay, then uh, we have a bottleneck. So that the dimension for the bottleneck gives you the dimension for the latent space. Okay, then we project from image space to the latent space. Then we project from uh, latent space to the, to the image space. Then we compare okay, the reconstructed data point okay, with the original data point. <clears throat> so therefore, the half network uh, learning the encoding map, okay, the later part learning the decoding map. Okay? So that is the uh, <clears throat> common understanding. So we use this one to do, okay. So if we use a ReLU DNN, then the whole mapping can be represented using this way. So uh, T1 compose sigma, compose T2, and so on. So each T here is a linear map, can be represented as a, as a matrix. Then the sigma is a ReLU function. So therefore, the composition is a piecewise linear function. So therefore, ReLU DNN is nothing, it's a piecewise linear function, OK? But globally, phi okay, is a continuous, OK? OK, <clears throat> now how can we visualize this piecewise structure? So if the whole thing is a piece, uh, is, a, is a linear, then the whole mapping is a linear. It doesn't make any sense. Just because using ReLU, everything becomes nonlinear. Okay. But uh, given a sample point x, okay, so this x will activate, okay, some nodes in the network. So so the activated nodes will form a path, okay, in the network. Given two points, okay, x1, x2. So we say they are equivalent. So if they share the same activity to pass, okay? So basically, by this uh, equivalence relation, we can partition the input space to many cells. So each, each cell corresponding to a unique activity to pass, okay? Then within each cell, the mapping is linear, okay? But across different cells, the mapping is nonlinear, okay? So then we can visualize this cell structure, okay? <coughs> like this one. So basically, uh, we use the Buddha as the data manifold, then we sample this data manifold using million points on this Buddha. Then using autoencoder, the input dimension is a three, the output dimension is two. And then we see that, okay, we realize, okay, the latent space image from this one to this one, we see it's really a homeomorphism. Okay, basically autoencoder really learned this, okay, manifold structure. After reconstruction, we map this guy to this guy. So if you compare this one with this one, you see that the reconstruction result looks really good. Okay, so this is uh, uh, verify our okay our assumption. Okay, basically autoencoder can really learn some manifold structure. Okay, but then uh, um, 
But suppose here we put, a, okay, 10,000 samples. The parameter could be 5,000, 50,000. So basically this means the efficiency for learning is not so good. So it's over parameterized, but it still can do the job. Then how can we visualize the piecewise structure? Okay, so this is the piecewise linear structure. So here we, we, we can visualize the cell decomposition. So the points within each cell we use the same color. So therefore we see we have so many hyperplanes partition the space. So this will induce a, okay, a polygonal or polyhedral okay, cell decomposition. Then if we restrict the whole map from one cell okay, to the target cell in the latent space, the mapping is linear. Okay? But then for this for the encoding part, for decoding part, then we have more redo DN. So therefore the cell decomposition becomes more complicated. Okay? So therefore you see that um, <clears throat> the power, okay, the learning capability for the neural network depends on how many pieces okay, it can represent. Okay? So therefore, we define the complexity uh, for ReLU DNN. So given a ReLU DNN, we define the learning capability as the upper bound or the number of pieces or all PL functions it can represent it. Okay? So basically, this is a very rough okay, measurement. But this can be uh, easily estimated using a computational geometry. Um, we can find the upper bound okay, very easily to compute it. Okay? So therefore, this gives you an index to indicate how powerful the, the, the deep learning model is. Okay, but on the other hand, we try to quantify how difficult to learn a manifold. So here we, we show very simple 1D manifold, a curve here and a curve here. So for this curve, basically, uh, we can do projection. We project this, this curve to a horizontal line, then this projection is a homomorphism. Okay, the projection is one to one on two, okay? But if we get this curve here, so no matter which direction you project, okay, you cannot get a one-to-one -one map. So in other words, if you want to use the piecewise linear function to learn this guy, you have to subdivide this curve to different segments. Okay? So therefore, give you a manifold, then what's the minimum number of pieces okay, to partition it such that uh, each part can be linearly projected. So that number is called the complexity for the manifold. So basically, this complexity represents the difficulty for a manifold to be learned, okay? So then uh, it's very easy to, to see that if we have a neural network which can learn a manifold, then uh, the complexity for the neural network should be greater, okay, than the complexity for the neural network, okay? It's pretty straightforward. Okay, then uh, given a ReLU DNN with a fixed architecture, we can easily construct a manifold Okay, such that the DNN cannot learn this manifold. Okay, basically. So this is very intuitive, right? Uh, using a conventional piano curve, uh, we can construct okay, uh, manifolds with a very high complexity. Okay, <clears throat> but here we give you a, a constructive proof for this. <clears throat> okay, then uh, the second part, uh, how does uh, deep learning control the probability distribution? Okay, so this is uh, extremely useful for a GAN model. Uh, we know for GAN model, um, <clears throat> we generate a wet noise okay, in the latent space. Then using GAN model, we can map this, this point to a point on a human facial manifold, which gives you a human facial photo. Okay. So that's the general framework. We have a discriminator, we have a generator. So the generator okay, uh, convert a wet noise to a generated example. So discriminator can tell the difference between real data and the generated data, okay? So then the discriminator and the generator, they compete with each other and improve both of them, reach the equilibrium. So that's the conventional explanation. Then a good fellow um, explained this one using the language of probability distributions. So suppose in the, Z, uh, in the latent space, we have a Gaussian distribution, uh, Z here. So the generator convert or transform this white noise to this uh, distribution, the green curve distribution here. Okay, so the dotted curve representing the real data distribution. Okay, the discriminator compute the distance between real data distribution and the generated distribution. So therefore, you see that um, the major task for discriminator is try to compute the, the, the distance between two distributions. Okay, the major task for generator is convert from one distribution to another distribution. Okay, so this is the 
language for explained by good fellow, okay? Then this is exactly the same language for optimal transportation, okay? So using our model, so basically we have a, a data manifold, okay? We have a real data sample here, which is, a, which is a new, okay? So new is a Dirac measure, but if you sample dense enough, okay, so this one will, will convert weakly to the real data distribution. In the latent space, we have a Gaussian distribution or uniform distribution Z here. So the generator mapping, okay, from latent space to the data manifold, okay, mapping, okay, the distribution here to the distribution mu C to there. So the discriminator computing the distance between the generated distribution and the, the sample distribution, okay? So this is the, okay, um, <coughs> visualization for, for the gap model, okay? <coughs> Okay, then we can come to the um, optimal transportation theory. So basically, uh, I can, we can see this one. Suppose we have uh, two domains uh, in R3, or in, in Rn, in Euclidean space. We have two density functions, one is mu, okay, the other is nu. So basically, we try to find the mapping, okay, from, from domain x to domain y, such that uh, the mapping is a mirror preserving, okay? <clears throat> For example, uh, suppose this is the, the total territory for, for the United States. Then we have two density functions. One is a potato production rate. Okay, how many tons okay, potatoes produce per acre per year? And new is a potato consumption rate. How many potatoes uh, are eaten okay, within each year, uh, uh, one, one acre? So like in the New York area, okay, the consumption rate is really high. Production rate is really low. So for, for big company, okay, like government, okay, they try to find a way to transport potato from one place to another place, such that the production and the consumption should be balanced, okay? Uh, also, such kind of plan is not unique. There are infinitely many such kind of plans. So we try to minimize the total gasoline, okay? So how can you find a, a plan or mapping, okay, to minimize the total cost? Also satisfy production and consumption rate. So that's the problem for optimal transportation. Then we put everything in rigorous term. So basically, how do we say the mapping is a measure preserving? So basically, we have mapping T here. For any measurable set B, okay, the new volume for B equal to the uh, mu volume for the uh, pre-image of B. Okay? So this equation holds for arbitrary measurable set B. Then we say the mapping is a measure preserving, meaning the production and the consumption are balanced. Okay, so if we assume T is a smooth, then uh, T satisfies the Jacobi equation, okay? So basically, uh, the Jacobi, okay, equal to the, the ratio between two density functions, okay? <clears throat> then, uh, um, <clears throat> so if we define CXY, meaning the cost to transport one ton potato from point X to point Y, okay, now how many, uh, okay, um, or how much gasoline we consume, then we can measure the total cost for the mapping. Basically, for each unit element, okay, we multiply the density, integrate on the whole space, that gives you the cost. Then uh, the Munch problem, okay, is uh, stated as follows. So basically, we try to find a measure preserving map, T, which minimize the total transportation cost, okay? Basically, we try to solve this uh, optimization problem. So if such kind of map exists, then uh, the map is called an optimal uh, transportation map. The cost for the optimal transportation map uh, is called the Wasserstein distance between two distributions. Okay, so that's the basic definitions. Okay, <clears throat> then the Mang uh, raised, raised this problem in the 18th century, and uh, sold by Kanta Roich, okay, uh, <clears throat> in 1950s, I think. So basically, Kanta Roich relaxed, okay, the transportation map to something called a transportation plan or transportation scheme. So basically, he defined a joint probability row here. The marginal, uh, the marginal okay, of probability equal to mu and the nu. Then we try to minimize, okay, this functional. And this become to a linear problem, okay? So then uh, Kanta Roich uh, invented linear programming and he got a Nobel Prize in economics in 1975 by solving uh, Munch problem, okay? But then, uh, um, <clears throat> Kanta-Roich formulation has a dual form, 
okay, <clears throat> which equivalent to find the two function, phi and psi, such that we try to maximize the expectation of phi and the expectation of psi. The phi and the psi satisfy pointwisely this constraint. Okay, this can be further write down. Okay, using something called a C transform. Okay, so all the existing machine learning method based on Watson distance actually, uh, okay, computing this guy. Okay, they, they use this kind of formulation. Okay, this formulation is pretty general for all the cost functions. But in 1980s, okay, uh, Brenier uh, discovered another fact. So basically, uh, if the cost function is a, um, a quadratic Euclidean distance, in this case, the optimal transmission map is given by a convex function u. The gradient of u gives us okay, the map. Okay? So therefore, using Brenier setup, basically, we, we need to solve this convex function u, okay, which push forward um, measure mu to measure nu here. Okay? Okay, then everything boils down finding this u, then you satisfy um, the classical motion pay equation. So basically, it's highly non linear. Mm. Given function u, we compute the Heisen matrix, the determinant of Heisen matrix equal to the ratio between two density functions. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> but then uh, from, but this equation, this equation actually is very familiar for mathematicians, basically. But then the Brunier theory is, uh, is broader than only in the quadratic distance. For arbitrary, okay, uh, should it be you. This should be you. Yeah, the, the table should be you. Sorry for that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Um, for if the cost function is any convex function, written this way, then the Brunier theory still holds, but in a more uh, complicated case. Then the uh, from this equation, we get the following relation. So ux equal to this one minus this one. So this is the counter rowage potential. The u is a Brenier potential. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Then everything actually is closely related to convex geometry. So the following problem is well known, which is called the Minkowski problem. Basically, suppose we have a convex um, polyhedron in R3. So we know the normal to each phase. Okay. But also, we know the area to each phase. So the area and the normal, they, they satisfy this linear constraint. Then uh, Minkowski asks whether such kind of convex polytope exist, whether it is uh, unique. Okay? So basically, then he proved that uh, such kind of okay, convex polyhedron exist and unique. And this can be held for arbitrary dimension. For high dimension, in Rn plus 1, we have an n-dimensional convex polytope. We know the volume, okay, for each facet. We know the normal to each facet, okay. Then, uh, how can we determine, okay, such kind of convex polytope, okay? Um, <clears throat> then the Minkowski proved the existence and the uniqueness. But later, Alexandrov, okay, in 1950s, generalized a uh, Minkowski problem to an uh, open convex polytope. So here we have an open convex polyhedron. Then uh, we know the normal to each face, okay. But also, we know the projected area for each phase, okay, to a convex domain uh, in R2. And Minkowski proved that uh, such kind of, okay, given the area, given the normal, we can determine the convex polytope, unique up to a vertical translation, okay? Then this holds for arbitrary dimension as well, okay? Um, <clears throat> actually, okay, the PDE governing this problem, okay, is exactly motion pay equation. Okay, so just now we say the Brenier potential satisfy motion pay equation. Okay, so here. Okay, then the, for Alex and now problem, same thing, same PDE. So this means they are talking about the same problem, but from different angle. One is from geometry, one is from probability theory. Okay, so therefore, if, if we can solve Alex and now problem, we can solve Brenier potential. We can solve optimal transmission map. Okay, same thing. But unfortunately, uh, Alex Nauss proof is based on algebraic topology, which is not a constructive. So uh, later we, we try to find a way uh, using uh, variational calculus to solve this problem. Then in uh, 2013, um, we found a way to do that. So basically, so if, if we are given the normals, okay, then uh, given the areas, 
So basically, we can find the convex polytope, okay, as the graph of this function, okay, it's the upper envelope for several planes, many planes, okay. Then uh, the solution can be obtained by uh, convex optimization. So here we define a functional. By maximizing this functional, we can find, okay, such kind of function, okay. <clears throat> so that's the preprint uh, online. <clears throat> okay. So basically, the functional uh, can be represent, uh, can be uh, understood as the volume. So given a convex polytope, and uh, given the projection of the uh, con con of this convex polytope on the plane, so we have a cylinder. Okay, the cylinder removes the convex polyhedron. Okay, the volume for the for the left part is the energy. Okay, um, <clears throat> then uh, we can calculate the gradient of this guy. The gradient actually can be given by the target volume minus the current volume. The target volume minus current volume. Okay, we can also calculate the Heisen. Okay, so basically, um, <clears throat> we can go to this picture. Um, okay, here is is fine. Basically, we have a convex polytope. So the projection gave us a cell decomposition on the plane. Then the, the Poincaré dew of the cell decomposition gave us a triangulation. So here we see the triangulation and the blue cell decomposition. Then uh, for each edge, okay, each edge here corresponding to a dew edge, okay, the, the, the black edge here corresponding to a blue edge here, okay, the blue edge here corresponding to... Right, right, yeah, it's generalized, yes, exactly. Yeah, then the ratio between, uh, okay, edge and dual edge give us the Heisen matrix. So therefore, we know the Heisen, we know the gradient, we can use the Newton's method to optimize this one. And this picture holds for arbitrary dimension, yeah, can be generalized to high dimension. But if we change, if we change the cost function, the picture still holds, but it become more complicated. So here, the convex function is given by the upper envelope for many, many planes. But if we change the cost function, then the hyperplane will be changed to other shapes. Okay, the upper, upper envelope for many, like parabolas, something like that. But still, the theory is pretty general, can, can be generalized further, okay? <clears throat> okay, then we come back to the GAN model. So we know that for, for GAN model, the, the, the discriminator compute the distance between two distributions. The generator computing, okay, the transformation from one to the other. Okay, then uh, our conventional WGAN, basically they use L1 uh, cost function. So basically, the Wasserstein distance between generated distribution, data distribution, equivalent to finding this uh, uh, counter rowage potential, finding this max, okay? Then uh, for generator, basically, we they try to uh, minimize, okay, this uh, Wasserstein distance, finding the, the good, okay, generation mapping here, okay? So you see, this conventional way to do uh, uh, w get okay okay <clears throat> but uh, according to Brunier theory we see that uh, u equal to one half x norm square minus phi so phi representing discriminator the u representing uh, the generator so therefore uh, t can be obtained from d without training so that this this means that also d can be obtained from g without training so therefore, the two deep neural networks are redundant, okay? And uh, the competition between D and G is, uh, is unnecessary from this, this theoretic point of view, yeah. But from competition point of view, it's different, okay? <clears throat> so therefore, this theory could be utilized to Im improve the efficiency for, for GAN model, okay? So th that is one major point. So then in reality, basically, suppose we have a lot of examples, YI, so for each data sample, uh, we, 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 we get a, a third function there. So this gives you the empirical distribution. So this will be the target distribution we try to learn, okay? Um, then suppose the source is uniform from disk, from 2D case. So then uh, this one means that we try to find a partition for the, for the unit disk, uh, such that, so for each cell, the cell area equal to the given probability, okay, for, for, for that point. And also, among all possible partitions, we try to minimize this uh, transmission cost, okay? So this is the discrete version for OMT. Okay, then according to our theory, basically, we try to find the linear potential, or Alexandrov convex polytope. 
So the construction is as follows. So given a point here, yi, we can, we can construct a plane. So the gradient of this plane, right, the slope of this plane equal to yi, okay? But the height is unknown. So therefore, if we have many, many examples here, we have many, many planes there. Then we found the upper envelope of those planes give you a convex polytope. Then we adjust the height for each plane such that the projected area, okay, equal to the given, given measure on this point, okay? So, so this is the, uh, okay, upper envelope. Then, then this is the, uh, the round deal of this convex function. Then the, the, the projection or the round deal give, give us a, okay, triangulation, okay, power Delaunay triangulation. The projection for, for this upper envelope give us the power Voronoi diagram, okay? So they, they are due to each other by Poincaré deal. So they are due to each other by the round deal, okay? So you can solve either here or you solve either here, okay? So this is the geometric view for solving a, a L2 case, or OMT. Okay, so here you'll see that if we change the height for one supporting plane, so the projected area will be changed. Okay, very, uh, uh, okay, intuitive. But then the optimization is highly linear. Finding the exact height is, is, a, is a non-trivial, it's not a linear problem, okay. Okay, then uh, using this picture, we can explain um, the difficulty for, for GAN model, like mode collapsing. So we know that GANs are very difficult to train and very sensitive to hyperparameters. Uh, so GANs suffer a lot from mode collapsing. So sometimes the generated distributions miss some modes, or GANs can generate unrealistic samples. Okay, sometimes it can cover all the modes, but then uh, generated a lot of fake samples. How can we explain this? Okay, um, <clears throat> then we, we, okay, we come to the regularity theory for optimal transmission map. Okay, <clears throat> uh, so this is a classical setup. So given two domains, okay, in Rn, given two, okay, density functions. Suppose density functions are in L1 space, okay, with total equal measure, and both uh, density functions are bounded, okay. Um, <clears throat> from zero, <clears throat> okay. Uh, then uh, according to uh, uh, counter Roach theory, so we can, we can deduce eventually the PDE here. So this PDE is, is for general cost function, not only for IL2, okay. So basically we try to analyze okay, the smoothness for the solution to this PDE, okay. Okay, <clears throat> then the uh, Kappa Reddy, okay, obtain the regularity of optimal transportation for, for this uh, quadratic case. Then uh, he says the follows. Suppose the density functions, okay, are smooth, okay, are positive and are smooth. Okay, holders uh, continuity is alpha. Okay, then uh, the target domain is convex. Okay, so this is important. The target is convex. So then uh, the Brunier potential basically is a uh, two degree higher, okay, than the density. Okay, <clears throat> then uh, uh, it's given different condition, but also everything required Omega oh, star is a convex, okay? And then given the smoothness for the density function, we can get a smoothness for, for the, okay? <clears throat> for general case, uh, it's given by uh, Ma Schrodinger one condition. Same thing, uh, <clears throat> if the, the problem satisfy four condition, okay? The first one guarantee uh, <clears throat> that the, the transmission map exists, not only in the transmission plan, okay? And the third, okay, is really a, very really complicated and first discovered by Wang, and this one is really essential, okay? Then the, the last one, the target must be convex. In this case, we can guarantee, okay, uh, the solution is a smooth, higher than the, okay, than the density function, okay? But in reality, nobody can guarantee uh, the target is convex. So if the target is non-convex, what will happen? Okay, so it's pretty, uh, uh, <coughs> Straightforward to see, okay, see several examples, okay. Okay, so for the simple case, suppose, okay, the source is a uh, regular rectangle. We have uniform distribution there, but the target has two kinetic components. Then we see that we map this part to there, we map this part to there. So in the middle, there's a line, okay, along the line, the mapping is a discontinuous, okay. But if the okay, target is connected but non-convex, 
concave. Then we see still we get a two line segment here. Then the uh, okay <clears throat> along this line the mapping is not continuous. Okay, for general general case, okay we come to here. So basically the, the source is a unit disk, but the target is a okay a irregular shape. We have a hole there. Then we have a concave boundary. Then the, there will be some okay singularity side. Okay, so each point on the singular side mapping to a, to a line segment here. Okay, so the bifurcation point here mapping to a triangle here. Okay, then this single point, okay, okay, map to the whole area here. Okay, so therefore we see that the behavior for the uh, optimal transmission map is complicated. Then we can visualize this one. <clears throat> Suppose we have a solid ball. Okay. Then uh, we have uniform, okay, inside a solid ball. We map the, the solid ball to this solid uh, Stanford bunny using the method we introduced. Then we, we, we do morphing and see, okay, okay, the final final mapping. So then we see that, okay, the surface of the, of the bunny actually is folded, okay? We map the whole thing to a solid ball, but the surface of a bunny has a lot of folded words, okay? When we cross the foldings, okay, the mapping is not continuous anymore, okay? Okay, then uh, if we realize, okay, for three clusters, so here we have three discrete clusters, we map from unit disk to, to them. Then we see that's the Brunier potential. Brunier potential is a smooth, except three uh, edges there. We have three okay, edge. When we cross the edge, the mapping is not smooth anymore, okay? <clears throat> so therefore, we see the intrinsic conflict we know that uh, ReLU DNN or general DNN can only represent continuous mappings, but the transportation maps are discontinuous, okay, on singular side. So therefore, um, <clears throat> so this means that the target mapping are outside the functional space of DNNs. So therefore, the training cannot converge, or the training cannot be stable. Yeah. Okay. Then uh, how can we avoid okay the mode collapse? Basically, we can model. Okay, to compute the Brunier potential instead of computing the transmission map itself. There could be a solution to that. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So here we will do one uh, experiment to, to see that. So basically we're using a uh, <clears throat> CWA to train a data manifold. Okay, then in the latent space we found a line segment connecting two pictures. Okay, so this is one point, this is another point. We draw a line segment okay on the latent space. We, we map back this, uh, this the line segment to a curve on the data manifold. Then you get a morphing sequence from the first one to the last one. But in the middle, you see, okay, okay some face, uh, one eye is blue, one eye, one eye is brown. So we believe this is the really rare case on the boundary of the human face manifold. Okay? So this shows that this line segment cross the singular, singular site okay, in the latent space. Okay? Okay, so this gives you a real example to support our argument. Okay. <clears throat> okay. <clears throat> um, then how can we avoid this kind of situation? We propose this framework. So basically we see that deep learning has two major tasks. One is manifold learning, one is a probability uh, distribution transformation. We separate two tasks, okay? For manifold learning, we're still using deep learning framework like autoencoder we map from data manifold to the latent space and then map the, the, the okay, distribution okay, to the latent space distribution. Another one is a, okay, a probability dis, uh, transformation from white noise to the data distribution. So this time we can separate using the geometric PDE method okay, to solve. So therefore, this type become totally transparent, which is a convex and easy to analyze and control. But this part is still a uh, black box. Then we make the whole black box to, to be part of black box, part of a transparent model. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, we see that solving motion pay equation reduced to a convex optimization, which has a unique solution. Okay. Then uh, the optimization will not be trapped in the local optimum. Then uh, the Hessian matrix can be uh, computed. So therefore, we can use Newton's method or quasi Newton to improve the convergence. Then uh, the approximate accuracy can be fully controlled can be analyzed, okay? Okay, so also the OMT part can be paralyzed. 
So here we can compare some result. Uh, we generate uh, MNIST. So this is a result from VE model. This from WGAN. We see a lot of okay, a lot of cases which are not realistic. Okay, generated between modes. Okay, but using AE or MT model, our model, we see things getting better. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> so here we, we compare the syllabus A. Okay, then uh, <clears throat> this one using WGAN method, then we see a lot of failure case within the same training time. Then, uh, okay, we using WGAN DIV. Okay, we see. Uh, if we're using CR again, we see mode collapse. So we, we see a lot of similar image, okay? <clears throat> Although we randomly example, okay? But using uh, our model, we, we get, a, get a betting result here, okay? So here we have a small video. <clears throat> you do still get some singular uh, events there. Right, still, yeah, because the, the mapping has a, yeah. <clears throat> So we see the mapping sequence. <clears throat> okay. Okay. <clears throat> So here we can see some mm, details. Mm. So basically, we change uh, the cost function from I1 to quadratic cost function, and then using our framework to compute the second part. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> then if we use EOT on smaller data set, we can see the interpretation. Yeah. Then we we also test on other data set, and then compare. Okay, using different criteria with uh, uh, the state of art. Okay. Uh, our result get, get, get a better result, and then completely avoid the mode collapse. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So, um, so in summary, so basically, uh, this work introduced geometric understanding uh, of deep learning. So we believe that the intrinsic pattern for natural data can be represented as a manifold distribution hypothesis. So the fundamental data structure, okay, should be a manifold with a distribution on the manifold. Then the deep learning can represent this data structure using the parameters for the, for the network. Yeah, <clears throat> then basically, the deep learning has two major tasks. One is a manifold learning, learning the encoding, decoding map, or one of them. One another probability distribution, okay? And the probability distribution is encoded by the transformation from white noise, okay, to, to the data distribution. Um, <clears throat> okay, so optimal transformation method can accomplish the, the second task. And by Brunier theory, so the generator and the discriminator should collaborate instead of compete with each other. So they can, they need to share the intermediate result. Okay, basically they are compute, computing the same thing from this point of view. Then uh, the regularity theory of motion pay can explain the mode collapsing and the training difficulty. Then by using uh, AE OT framework, we can uh, partially avoid mode collapse and make half the black box transparent. Okay. Okay, so that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, also, we are recruiting a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, so if you are interested in uh, doing uh, okay, deep learning, uh, then please contact me, email me. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Question? So uh, when you're learning manifolds, in case manifold goes through some rigid transformation, like it is rotated or something, uh -huh. so is your uh, mm -hmm. network able to learn that as well? I mean, does uh, okay. it matter? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, currently, um, <clears throat> we were just using a common uh, deep learning method, like autoencoder to do that. So if you move, okay, the, the whole point cloud by rigid motion, that doesn't, doesn't matter. Yeah. Then the method we, we showed here, um, <clears throat> okay, in our slides, we show a lot of uh, illustration. That one actually using a geometry method. Okay, let me go to the beginning. <clears throat> okay. 
Uh, actually, this one is a so MPD is on surface. So the, this one is only depends on the remaining metric. Okay, so the shape doesn't matter. So if you rotate it, translate it, or deform it, okay, isometrically, the mapping doesn't change. So this is a remaining mapping. But, but uh, you know, geometric PD method cannot be generalized to very high dimension because representing the, the triangulation is really expensive. Okay, the complexity for a similar complex will be uh, exponential with respect to uh, the data. Yeah. But so, so for very high dimensional manifold learning, it seems deep learning is the only method so far. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, no problem. Have you thought of using the Morse, the Morse function defined on uh, your manifold? Oh, on yes. Your, yeah. On your uh, uh -huh. source domain manifold? Mm, um, and, and, uh, uh, mm. and use that instead? Yeah, basically, we try to analyze the, the singularity okay, uh, using a MERS function, so to, to analyze topology as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, then uh, mm, we are also thinking about, basically, for machine learning, they, they try to minimize some functional within the, the functional space. Then, uh, okay, then uh, the, the singularity corresponding to the solution. In, in order to prove the existence of the solution, MERS function theory should be useful. Yeah, we are thinking along that line. Yeah, but, but still, it's... Uh, yeah, haven't haven't reached that point yet. Yeah. Because yeah. That, that, at least uh, uh, experimentally, we, we we kind of started doing something like that, be, in the sense where one could we can talk about it uh, offline, okay. of course, where you you know at least in theory you should be able to also reconstruct your uh, you know your manifold right, from right. the level sets of your right, right. Of, of your Morse function. Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah, we are trying to uh, use that one to prove the, the deep learning method. <laughs> yeah, I think that that's, that's a good one. Yeah, very powerful tools. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I have two two questions. Uh -huh. uh, one is, uh, how about a graphic model? For example, you, you have a graphic model. Each node has a, is a is a manifold. Right. But right. Uh, those manifold yeah. is kind of the marginal manifold. The right. Graphic model itself is a joint manifold. Okay. So this, uh -huh. for example, if you Mm -hmm. Consider for GAN, so now right. that people are doing GAN, like uh, it's not just for one pattern or face or some uh, single right. image, single right. uh, object. Like, suppose right. you want to generate mm -hmm. a multiple uh, mm -hmm. object in a consistent mm -hmm. and coherent way, right? Suppose you have a, a big scene, many right. objects appear, but those right. appear, those layout and style are very natural. Right. So that right. means you need to capture. Right. Uh, right. In in terms of this graphic configuration, a right. configurable, right? Right. Do, right. do you have any, I mean, uh, comments? Uh, yeah, on we, that, we, right? we think along that line. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so basically, uh, for, for manual learning, um, <clears throat> people using, a, for example, using autoencoder, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> then basically they, they try to find uh, two maps. Okay. One's the inverse or the other. So therefore, they, they use a symmetric architecture for that. But then that, 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 that sounds very intuitive, but there's no theoretic guarantee that this one really, really found the exact inverse of that one. In fact, they, 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 they do not. So the, the, the major difficulty for deep learning is that, so how can we quantify, okay, the, the functional space represented by, by the current architecture? So in other words, so if I give you the combinatorial structure or, or topological structure, okay, or the neural network, then uh, what can we say to the, to the uh, constraints for the, for the functional space? Yeah, so basically, I think that's is a really fundamental problem. Yeah, yeah as you mentioned, um, also mentioned by Professor Zhu, how can we use, uh, whether we can use an uh, algebraic topology method to, 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 to do that. Yeah, so like currently, we try to find a, the transposition map, which is not continuous outside of the functional space. But for other, for other solutions, maybe they have different special properties. But how can you design your functional space, which can hold the solution? Yeah, so I think this is really fundamental. Yeah, and there will be a lot of research along that line. So, so far we all just say the capability for this network is uh, quantified by the number of pieces it can represent. But uh, the, the estimation for the, for the bound or the pieces is really, really rough. How can you find a sharp bound, okay, tight bound? It's a, it's a big problem as well, yeah. So still a lot of things along it there, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The attack. Right, right, right. 
you need Cal, uh, Cal body to auto attack, right? Right, uh, exactly. I wonder whether from your perspective, yes. can you explain uh, why yeah. those attacks happen? Okay. And so, how to avoid those attacks? Okay, uh, so so there are different types of adversary attack. And uh, one, one commonly one is, is as follows. Okay, so as we see, basically, uh, suppose you have different classes, subclasses, right? After you map them to the to the latent space, right? And then if you want to do adversary attack, you just pick the, the, the example in the middle, okay? Not in the center, okay? Or different distributions. So if you can find a very good encoding decoding map, okay? If you can find the gap between the, the modes, okay? Then the, okay, all these kind of data are adversaries. Yeah, basically this is one way to represent uh, to, to to explain adversary uh, coding. Blind, blind spot. Right, right, right. Then uh, uh, another one we are working on is that, so basically, um, so given one image, then we can we can represent the diffeomorphism group from image to itself, which is an infinite dimensional manifold. But then we can really construct okay this manifold to some extent. Then basically we can we can deform one image okay arbitrarily, then we can use the deform image as a training sample to to, to make the system more robust. Yeah, mm. but but still. Uh, a lot of things along that line, but for for subclusters, I think this picture can give you give us some insight. Yeah, yeah. Is there mm. any possible way to them give you two network, right? They, right. They have different kind of vision. Right. So is there any way to, for example, to quant uh, quantify uh -huh. uh, how robust uh, is uh -huh. of each, right? Which one is ro more robust? Uh, more robust. Is there um, any way from the theoretical study? Um, mm. Actually. Um, <coughs> For 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 gun model, it's pretty simple because gun only um, only in the train the decoder, right? So the input is fixed, mm -hmm. just just uniform byte noise, right? Then uh, we 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 can we can we can get the distribution generated distribution. Now we can really measure the distance between two generated distribution. Now we can compare two generated distribution uh, with the real data distribution using a uh, okay what's the distance? So using this, you can get a rough idea. Which one get a better, yeah, better stuff? So the, the bottleneck is a computation. It's not highly non, non, non trivial, right? But using uh, using our method, we hope we can we can yeah, make it uh, easier a little bit. Yeah, but still, still takes time. Yeah, still. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. If there's no question, let's thank our speaker again. Thank you. Thank you.